today, this morning, you are part of history in Colorado. On August 1st, 1863, Reverend William Whitehead conducted the very first worship service of First Baptist Church in Golden, Colorado. Now, First Baptist Church is the oldest Baptist church in Colorado, 155 years and counting. And we believe that God has called us to be a force for good in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now, down through the years, tens of thousands of men and women and children have served God, have worshiped God, and told others about Jesus. And you are in line with that. Now, we have some people in our church that that don't like the spotlight. However, they happen to be leaders of different ministries. And we thought, as elders, it would be a really great idea for us to say thank you for their leadership. Now, think about this. Down through the years, there have been lots of different pastors, lots of different leaders, lots of different people, and these folks fall in line with those tens of thousands of people that have been serving God and telling others about Jesus for 155 plus years. So we threw a lunch for them last Sunday, and we wanted to show you a few pictures of this. Just go ahead and scroll through those as I talk. Now, the thing that was impressive to us, there's a thing called the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle is basically this. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. 80% of the giving is done by 20% of the people. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. You know, you've, you've experienced that before, right? When we tallied up all the different people who serve in this church, we came up with over 80. Now, of a church between 125 and 150, that's a big percentage. And so I want to say a huge thank you, not just to our leaders, but to, and not that microphone either, but to every single person who, who serves God in this place or as a result of what's happening here. So uh, one, one hand clapping wouldn't be enough. So let's give, let's give God a hand for the service that takes place here. I wonder, would it ever have entered into Reverend Whitehead's mind or the mind of the barbers, the lakes, the huntsmen, the Snodgrass family or the the Costo family to think that 155 years later, we would be here worshiping God together. We say it like it's a novel thing that God has called us to be a force for good and golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now, now the way we have phrased it is a little novel to us, but I can tell you from the very beginning, the church saw itself as the gospel center of golden. The church has always said, we need to be sharing Jesus' love with other people. And so down through the years, that is what this church has been about. And as we have been studying the book of Ephesians together, what we have seen time and time and time again is that Jesus came to provide a place that's healthy and united centered on his love and on his message so that so that we could go from this place to share Jesus with other people because that is what's important that is what we are all about and so as we come together we saw last week that in the first 16 verses of chapter 4, we, we, see, we see that that our unity grows best in the soil of diversity. We're all different people, different languages, different countries, many of us, different age groups, different genders, and all gifted differently, specifically by God, for you and I to work together to accomplish His purposes. That is what... The church is all about, and a healthy, united church is God's plan for world transformation. You get to take part. It's not just Reverend Whitehead and those 15 other people. 
you get to take a part in transforming the world by doing one simple thing. Allowing the Holy Spirit to continue to grow you and to shape you and to mold you into the woman or man that God wants for this church to build up the unity, to build up who we are, to help us grow to become more like Him. So, He has a plan to grow a healthy and united church. He told us already in the first 16 verses that it's important for us to realize that 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 plan is, is for us to grow in the soil of diversity, a unified, healthy body. Now the next half of chapter 4, which I, I'm going to encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, page 816, I believe it is in the pew Bible in front of you, is God's plan to continue growing unity. Now the rest of the book is going to be all about growing unity in different facets of it. But there are three things that he says in the next uh, uh, section of chapter 4 that we want to look at. There are three phases. The first phase comes in verses 17 to 19 of chapter 4. We read, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now catch this. Don't walk in the futility. They walk in the futility of their minds. Let's don't do that. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So what's he's, the picture he's drawing here is, is of, of everyone who is outside of Christ. There are really only two people in the world. People who know Jesus and are living life in Jesus and people who do not. Now that's not the, the good and the bad. I mean, we're not thinking, hey, we're in the good camp and ooh, they're in the bad camp. That's just the spiritual reality. But that's why we are called to share the gospel because we who are in that camp where we put our faith and trust in Jesus realize how empty and futile. It says the futility of their minds is how they functioned. They were alienated from God. The place they were at is is a spiritually desolate and dark place. And that is not at all where God wants them to stay. Before Christ, our minds were spiritually dead, separated from God. But now... As we've gone through the book of Ephesians, I cherry-picked just a couple things. Now, think about this. This is who you and I are if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Verse uh, 16 of chapter 3 says that we've been strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says that the very power that raised Jesus from the dead, that's the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you and me to enable us to live for God. That's who you are. That's who you are. Verse 17 of the same chapter says that that Christ dwells in your hearts. He dwells in your heart. Verse 19 says that we know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. You know God's love. If you don't know God's love, there's only two reasons. First could be that you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're a good person. You're a moral person. You go to church clearly. You're here but you've never under, recognized your own sin and your need for Christ and you've put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone to forgive you and to change you and to make you a new person. Don't let a second pass before you do that. Do that right now. Or you have not pushed in to what it means to be a disciple and to be a follower of Jesus. You got your fire insurance you come to church, you read your Bible, you do your thing, but you really don't push into who He is. And that's what we'll be talking about today. How can we do that? Now here's a passage. I had to jump out of Ephesians back to 1 Corinthians to, to get this one. But it summarizes really well a few things Paul is saying throughout the book of Ephesians. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that who is from God, 
that we might understand the things freely given us by God. But hear, hear this. We have the mind of Christ. You and I have the mind of Christ. And so when we yield ourselves more and more to this Holy Spirit and the things he's teaching us through God's word, our minds begin to be transformed and renewed and to begin to be changed so that we become more and more like Jesus. So the very first phase, how we're going to continue growing in unity is we leave the old. Leave the old. He said, remember how you used to act as a Gentile? That's not you anymore. We have to leave the old, but that's only the first part of the equation. You've probably heard it said that the clothes make the man. The clothes make the person. Well, there's some research to back that up. I pulled this um, from, a, um, actually, Reader's Digest. Anybody read the Reader's Digest? There's great stuff in there. But I did fact check it. It's true. Dressing in clothing that is associated with intelligence like doctor's coats or pilot's uniform may not only make you look smarter, may not only make you look smarter, they may actually make you act smarter too. According to a study published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, researchers gave doctors lab coats to subjects, none of whom were doctors, and then asked them to perform a series of complex tasks. Those in white coats made significantly fewer mistakes than the people in street clothes. So you want to look smart, get yourself a coat, a lab coat, and wear it. And when somebody asks you to say, I'm a doctor. Anyway, no, don't do that. Okay. The scientists then repeated the experiment, but this time gave lab coats to all the participants. However, they told half the people... Um, that they were doctor's coats while the other half they told them were painting smocks. <laughs> Again, the people in the doctor's coats perform better on the tests, which shows that it's not just what you wear, but also what you think of what you wear that matters. Now, the clothes that God puts on us do not simply make us feel smarter or think better. They completely remake us into the image of Jesus. So phase two, we've left the old in phase one, and we are putting on the new in phase two. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, but this is not the way that you learned Christ. Remember, he's contrasting with the way of, of our life when, when we were away from Jesus and our minds were darkened and we were far from him. That's not how we learn Christ. How an unbeliever lives and how a believer lives should be different. There should be a stark contrast. Now the interesting thing as he, we get into this, this section is it's not about the facts and figures that we're going to learn here that's going to make the difference in us. He's not about to list off all these different things that you're supposed to know and even things that you're supposed to do. He says that what's going to make a difference is that you learned Christ. Remember verse 20 says, but that's not the way you learned Christ. We learned a person. Why is that important? Because verse 21 says that truth is in Jesus. The truth is uh, of being a disciple of Jesus is that you know Jesus. It's Jesus' image that we are conformed to. So how will we know if we're being conformed to the image of Christ if we are not familiar with who Jesus is? Romans 8, Paul says this, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. You're not Jesus' disciple because you're able to spout a bunch of, of factoids from the Bible. Are you able to cite a verse or two? Jesus' disciples know Jesus because the better and the better we know Jesus, the more like Jesus we will become. And so the next couple of verses, we're going we're gonna to see three lessons that will teach us how to learn Jesus. Help us grow to become more like Jesus. 
Verse 22 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. The lusts, the old us gave into are deceitful. He calls them deceitful desires. Why are they deceitful? Because they promise things they cannot deliver. We're tempted to go with someone outside of the bonds of our marriage because we think it's going to make us feel better. We think it's going to fulfill us. And it will do nothing but destroy. At a professor in seminary, you might want to cover the kids' ears, I'll say this one. Had a professor in seminary who walked in to class one day after uh, another big name pastor or evangelist fell to moral, moral failure. He looked at us and said, uh, gentlemen, ladies, there's not an orgasm out there that's worth it. Not one. God wants us to be holy and to be pure and to be like Jesus to put off the old and remember that those things belong to the former manner of life and when we feel like those things are going to fulfill us remember how empty how desolate how worthless they were and they did not help now we're not just to say a simple no even though I respect Nancy Reagan, her, her, her plan, just say no, quickly became clear that just fell short. Because if all you do is just say no and you never replace it with something different, you don't make a change. You just feel bad about what you shouldn't do. And what happens when you feel bad about what you shouldn't do? You think about what you shouldn't do. And guess what happens when you think about what you shouldn't do? You end up doing what you shouldn't do. And it just makes you feel guilty which is what you don't want to do. But that's what we do. So, put off is the first lesson. The second lesson, verse 23 says, put those things off and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. The renewal of our minds is a continual, ongoing, lifelong process. Now, a lot of research has been done um, to help us understand how the brain functions what it can and can't do. And it is amazing to me the things that our brains can do. Now, with all the research that's out there, there, there's just a handful of researchers who are looking at this from a biblical perspective. One of the best books out there, at least that I've come across, is one called Switch, Your, Switch on Your Brain. This is by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And um, the insights that I've gained from this have been really, really encouraging to me. Um, Here's one of the things she says in her book. When you think, you build thoughts. And these become physical substances in your brain. Now, I'm not going to take time to flesh that out for you. I'm going to challenge you to get the book and read it for yourself. It's on page 25, that quote I just shared with you. Um, or you want any of the resources, you let me know and I'll let you know. But I think that there's some really incredible things that, that in the way God designed our brains that if we will look at the scriptures we will see that science is finally catching up. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. Remember, when you think, you build thoughts and these become physical substances in your brain. And they actually change how you behave. Science has told us for a long time that the brain tells us what to do. You are predisposed toward this behavior because you have this thing in your brain. Well, the, the, the interesting thing that science is actually discovering is your brain doesn't tell you what to do. Your mind tells you what to do. And your mind is made up of what you think. So what you think changes what happens in your brain and changes how you behave. So Paul says... Put off the old, and in its place be renewed in your mind. Let God change you into who he wants you to be. So here's the equation. Good thinking leads to good choices, 
which lead to healthy thoughts. The opposite is true as well. Toxic thinking leads to toxic choices which lead to toxic thoughts. And the continuous cycle did not begin with your hard wiring. It began with your thinking. Do you know who you are? Help me out here. What do you know is true of you because you have a relationship with Jesus? What's true of you? You're forgiven. You're his child. You, when, you, when you die, you'll go home to be with him. What else do you know? Loved and forgiven. What else? You're enabled to do it, sure. So, this would be a great exercise to do. What do you know to be true of you? In a little while, as we come to the end, there's going to be five different ways that, that, that Paul tells us we need to allow the Spirit of God to renew our minds. When we get there, I'll remind you, I want to encourage you to think about each one of these. And as you think, ask the Spirit of God to show you which of these He wants you to focus on. And I'm going I'm to challenge you to focus on just one thing this week. You allow the Spirit of God to direct you in that place. So, because God knows that our good thoughts lead to good choices, which lead to healthy thoughts, and that cycle can continue, He lays out a, pro, a, a challenge to His people through Moses. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring, offspring may live. Now, the last part of that verse is really important because we need to always remember that the choices we make impact other people. How I choose to think will determine how I then choose to behave and that will impact all the important people in my life. And we need to understand that just because somebody chose sin doesn't mean you have to choose it. But because they chose sin, it impacts you. So if you grew up in a family and one of your parents, maybe both were alcoholics, you may have a predisposition toward alcohol, and some people should never have the first drink. If that's you, take that to heart. But some would say, because you have that predisposition, you can't help yourself. See, this is where this renewing your mind and thinking will make a difference because just because someone else did it doesn't mean you have to do it. You can choose to say no and when you choose to say no you pick, take a different path and you begin to rewrite the synapses in your brain to help you make better choices. And that is all straight from God's word where he tells us to be renewed in our mind. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Paul says in Romans 12, through God's Word. So the next thing he says for us to do in verse 24 is to put on the new. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we put off the old. We allow him to renew our minds and that enables us to put on the new. Every single day, the Holy Spirit continues to rewire our thinking if we will choose to allow him to do that. Every single day, the Holy Spirit will rewire your thinking and my thinking if we will simply allow him to do that. So he closes out the rest of this chapter. 
giving us five ways that the Holy Spirit wants to rewire our minds. Now here's your reminder. There'll be five things. I'm not going to challenge you to do all five of them. I'm going to challenge you to pick one. You pick the one that, that the Holy Spirit pokes and says to you, hey, this is you. Pay attention here, okay? Verse 25. This is phase three, by the way. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He's talking to the church, us. He's saying, we want to continue building unity, and here's the first thing. Speak the truth to each other. Don't lie to each other. Your neighbor, your fellow church member or attender has the right to be treated as a full-fledged member of Christ's body. Instead of lying, he says, speak the truth because that is going to build unity. This comes from, uh, it's a quote from Zechariah chapter 8. I, I didn't know that until I uh, looked in this passage um, more in depth. It says, we're, we're in Zechariah eight sixteen. he says, Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Judgments that are true and make for peace. Now, it's not simply good advice. There's a reason. The next part of this, of uh, Zechariah 8 says, Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath, for all these things I hate, declares the Lord. God hates it when we lie, not just because it break, breaks a commandment and it's against his character. He hates it when we lie because it reveals our hearts toward the other person. Our heart is not toward unity. Our heart is toward maybe self-preservation. When we lie, we are destroying the unity that God has for us. Now, you want to you think about how seriously God takes this. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They had property. They sold their property. And they decided to lie to the whole church. They said, hey... This is how much we sold our property for when they actually sold it for this much and kept part for themselves. It, the passage goes on to say, look, it was, it was yours. You could do with it what you want. Why did you choose to lie? Lying introduces insecurity into the, into the body because you, when you discover it, you, you don't know who you can trust. So, Paul is getting very meddling, meddlesome here. I think his, his advice is simple. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Now remember, truth in love. We don't want to run somebody over with our truth. Sometimes discretion, but never a lie. Second, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, there are times when anger is the right response. When someone takes the life of an innocent baby or someone commits some sort of injustice and you become aware of it, anger is very, very appropriate. But if we give full vent to our anger and we kill an abortion doctor, then we've crossed a line. when we become judge, jury, and executioner, then we've moved out of that righteous sort of anger into a, a violent sort of anger. So here's a good principle to live by. If somebody wrongs you, you do not have the right to wrong them back. You don't get a free shot. I like how the message says, takes this phrase. It says, don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. Repay no, no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's a tough one. But he goes on in this verse and he says, When you cross the line, we open the door for the devil to move among us. So I I think a question we have to be honest with ourselves and ask is, Am I simmering over something that someone did to me last week? Maybe it's a rolling boil. Maybe for some of us, it wasn't just something that happened last week. It's something that was done to us or against us months ago, years ago. When we let it sit on a low simmer or allow that rolling boil to continue, we are holding the door open for the enemy to come in to destroy the unity that Christ died for. And we need, we need to keep short accounts, to not allow the sun to go down while we're still angry. Now, a practicality is sometimes you can't get to somebody before the sun goes down. You, you, you don't have time, but you can drive a stake down and say, I'm going to deal with this, and you can let that person know. You can shoot a text, you can shoot an email, you can give them a call, and you can say, hey, we, we need to talk about this. Can we set an appointment? Can we do it? Let's be committed to maintaining the unity here. Can I tell you a secret? I'm flawed. And you hang around me for very long and I'm going to wrong you. And when I do, please tell me. Please come to me. And when you wrong me, I will come to you. And we won't do it because you're better than me or I'm better than you. We'll do it because we love Jesus' church. And we want this place to be healthy and united. And we will not let the sun go down on our anger. We will keep short accounts. Then he says, next thing, verse 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, theft is not a problem just because it's a breaking of the Eighth Commandment, and not just because it's, it makes God angry because it goes against everything he stands for but but like lying it introduces insecurity into the system into the church when you can't know that your stuff is secure now the point here is not simply theft really the point is also about making sure that we all have something to give because every single one of us according to verse 3 of chapter 4 is, is, is responsible to maintain the uni- unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So what's he saying to us? Instead of, instead of stealing, work with your hands so that you can give. The principle for all of us is give to those who have a need. Instead of, instead of taking someone else's, ask God to provide for us and do the hard work to make that happen so that we can have something to give to someone else. Next. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for those for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our words are meant to build up, to edify, not to destroy, not to tear down. The word unwholesome there refers to something that is decayed, rotting, and harmful. Our words are meant to build others up. First Thessalonians says it this way, encourage one another and build each other up. When our, when our kids were little, we came up with this, I, I don't say we, I won't blame Connie. I came up with this goofy little song and dance and I would just go, encourage one another and build each other up. Encourage one another and build each other up. You'll never get that image out of your mind, but hopefully the words will stay there because that's what we're supposed to be about, encouraging each other and building each other up. When we don't do that, when our words tear down, 
It says that we grieve, or you could translate the word distress, the Holy Spirit. Now, why would it bother the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit has been left, sent down by Jesus to make sure that we grow unified. And when we choose to do something that goes against that uni- unification of, our, of his body, then we grieve, we, we hinder, we distress the work that he's doing. So we, we take it seriously and we say, you know what? We want to make sure that we, our words are giving birth to healthy things and unifying things. Now, the word grieve is also often used in the context of birth pains in childbirth. So what's he saying? When we are grieving the Holy Spirit with our words, we are giving birth to destructive things that will grow and be nurtured in the church and keep us from being who we need to be. You want to be part of transforming the world? Take this one simple thing and let your words build up and edify. Last, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you all, excuse me, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Bitterness is hostility that we've nursed. It's a grudge that we have been holding on to something that we will not let go and it has poisoned us at the core. That's what bitterness does. You ever have somebody do something that would normally elicit a response of maybe a two on the the response scale and instead of getting a two, they get an eight or a nine and you kind of blow them out. They're like, wow, where'd that come from? You might have some bitterness lurking. And the, the interesting thing is it doesn't even have to be that with the person that you, that you came out at. It could just be there's something going on inside of you. We deal with bitterness so that we can maintain the unity in this church. The cure for bitterness and all of its symptoms is to remember what God did for you and to forgive as God in Christ forgave you. You think of whatever that person did to you. It's horrible. I'm I'm not downplaying it. I'm not saying you've got to take it lightly. I'm not saying you can just let it go immediately. You may have to process it. Forgiveness is something you can do much quicker than trust. Trust has to be re-earned. So I'm not, please don't hear me say more than I intend to. But if there is some bitterness in you, then, then the commitment to maintaining the unity in this body has to be to working through it. However the other person responds, that's our commitment. And we say, yes, we want to do that. The third phrase, phase excuse me, is to live Christ. We put off the old. We put on the new. And when we do, we live Christ. I hope that that you want to make an impact in this world. I hope that you want this world to be a better place because you were here. I hope that you, you long to be part of this movement, this force for good and golden and beyond by being a disciple of Jesus. If that is you, then what I think God would say to every single one of us is you can make an impact in Golden and beyond. You can make an impact in your place of work, in your neighborhood, in your sports club, any interaction you have with other people. If you'll take this truth seriously and you'll live Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, God. We don't deserve to be known as one of your children. We don't deserve to be part of such a a world-impacting thing as your church. And yet you've, you've chosen and you've allowed each and every one of us to be here.
Father, I pray that you would continue your work in us, that you bring the conviction in whatever of these five areas you want to do the most work in in us. And help us to live Christ. We can't do it on our own. It's the Spirit's work to renew our minds. But I pray that you will begin that process of showing us what area you want us to work and yield ourselves so that he can do his work. In Jesus' name, amen.